Extreme weather disrupts supply chains, causes delays and shortages for consumers and businesses. Climate change is literally an existential threat to our nation and to the world. This is an emergency. This is climate change. And scientists say, in order to stop it, we need to drastically reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, shift to clean energy, and keep up with demand by leveraging technology. If the demand of energy, demand and supply patterns will continue as we have seen so far, and then we will suffer more in the future. This report clearly emphasizes that we do have technology and know-how and tools to solve for the climate problems. Solar panels, electric vehicles, and wind turbines are just some of the climate tech being used today to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and get us closer to net zero by 2050. Clean energy roadmaps show that if we hope to reach this goal, nearly half of emissions reductions will have to come from technologies that aren't available yet. So authorities like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the International Energy Agency are urging governments to prioritize policies to aggressively scale up the solutions we have now and at the same time create and deploy new innovations to tackle the climate crisis. This means more investment, more R&D, and more innovation is needed and fast. But new technologies, as well as old ones, are dependent on a steady supply of silicon semiconductor chips. They're the brains of modern electronics. Well, today, almost any manufactured good relies on chips for its production and for its operation. not only smartphones or PCs, the types of goods we think that have ships inside of them, it's everything from cars to dishwashers to military equipment. And so access to the most advanced computer chips is critical for companies that are trying to sell the most capable products. And this is why China and the United States, two of the world's biggest superpowers, are locked in a battle over chips. We're seeing now with ChatGPT and other people that are intelligent significant changes in the way computing power is going forward. And this has significant implications for how wars will be found in the future, national security, the future of encryption, and other technologies which have not just national security implications, but also economic implications. Despite inventing the semiconductor, the U.S. only accounts for around 10% of global chip production compared to 24% in China. And in terms of the most advanced high-end chips, the kinds used in the latest smartphones, self-driving cars, quantum computing, and artificial intelligence for deep learning and defense, the U.S. plays a crucial role in design and equipment, but domestically, it makes zero. There are only two companies right now producing the smallest, most cutting-edge chips, and they're in Taiwan and South Korea. A new processor chip, for example, there will be, well, like the one in the iPhone, to, to use an example that's familiar, uh, there will be uh, billions of transistors, 10, 15, 20 billion transistors on a typical smartphone uh, chip, and each one of them is roughly the size of a coronavirus. And so it takes the uh, specialization of many different companies and many different countries across the supply chain to produce this. But although it's a very complex supply chain with lots of different companies involved, at every segment of the supply chain, there's often just one or two companies capable of producing the most cutting edge tools or software or material. Chip manufacturing is not just an international process, it's also an expensive business. To build a semiconductor fabrication facility alone can take three to five years and cost anywhere between 15 and $20 billion. When COVID-19 lockdown sparked a global chip shortage, it highlighted the importance of securing supply chains, as well as the world's dependence on semiconductor manufacturing in East Asia especially in Taiwan, which has China on its doorstep. In August of 2022, U.S. President Joe Biden signed the Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductor and Science Act, or CHIPS Act, 
writing into law a $280 billion package to promote tech innovation, including $52 billion in subsidies to promote reshoring of chip manufacturing to the United States. That move, which aims to ensure America's technological lead over China, was followed by further export controls to essentially cut off China from advanced chips necessary for AI models, supercomputers, hypersonic missiles, and the US-built chip design and manufacturing equipment needed to produce them. And the restrictions cover exports from any company in the world that uses American semiconductor technology. And if you look at the Chips and Science Act, it is all about reinvesting in science, which is great. I'm all for it as a physicist. But it's also about bringing that expertise and that manufacturing capacity both back to the U.S. and then to countries where the politics aren't so thorny. And so there have been investments in chip making in India. There's efforts to buy solar panels from Malaysia and Vietnam. There's a number of issues that the U.S. sees as a logical part of the portfolio, but clearly these are also significant digs at China. China responded by filing a complaint with the World Trade Organization against American trade protectionism and later retaliated by restricting the export of two important metals, gallium, which is used in LCD displays and solar cells, and germanium, vital for high-speed computer chips and the fiber optic cables that connect us to the internet. The reality is that China has become seen, in Washington at least, um, among the US political class as the pacing threat, um, as a strategic competitor, and in particular, um, as a competitor in strategic technologies. So the Biden administration's measures are really just consolidating and systematizing a general policy direction that was quite clear under Trump. Um, obviously, if we talk about export controls, for example, um, we already saw those introduced targeting Huawei back in 2019 um, in a fairly severe manner. Whether you're in South Korea or, uh, or in Europe or in Japan or the US, you have to consider these factors now. And I think every semiconductor company in the world is coming to terms with the, a new reality. Uh, whereby both uh, China uh, and, and governments outside of China, like the U.S., Japan, and others, are pursuing policies that are pushing towards a, a more partially bifurcated supply chain, in which uh, there will be a, a China-focused supply chain and a non-China-focused supply chain. Increasing China-U.S. competition is leading to a dangerous tit-for-tat that experts say will have impacts on all nations, the future of the world economy, and even more concerning, decarbonization efforts. Although China lags behind in the chip race, it's a powerhouse in clean energy technologies, controlling more than 75% of the world's electric vehicle battery and solar photovoltaic manufacturing supply chains, which include critical minerals like lithium and cobalt. Chinese official policy documents are increasingly referencing the need, including those specifically for the semiconductor sector, for green development. I think the issue for China will be that, um, again, its challenge in the context where it is being cut off from the global industry, at least on current trends by US government measures, is um, going to preoccupy its semiconductor industry with simple survival and import substitution. And in this context, of course, one might expect that green economy concerns perhaps take a back seat. Just 10 years ago, China and the US made a pledge to strengthen bilateral efforts on another major security concern, climate change. It set the stage for international climate action. But all that cooperation is gone, replaced by tech and trade wars that are now putting the green transition at risk. The US and China both know that they need each other and that our shared need for each other is larger than the differences. Political leaders are gonna to have to work out those differences. That's not a simple process, 
But if the fundamental is that we only both benefit by working together, there's at least a pathway to reduce tensions, to recognize that the global need for green is so large that we both need to clean up our act. We need to get off fossil fuels. We need to access the materials in sustainable ways.